All right, so in the past three videos, I laid the three major cornerstones of Einstein's relativity. And so I highly suggest you go watch those because they're amazingly well done videos. Thank you very much. And they give us a peek into Einstein's mind as over the course of seven years, he developed general relativity. And the key takeaway, the key takeaway is that gravity is curvature. Curvature is gravity. The curvature of space time is what we call the gravitational force. So that's a wonderful idea, but even an idea coming from Einstein, there's going to be some skeptics. There's going to be non-believers. Uh, we need some evidence. We need to, he needs to back this up, right? You can't, you just can't come up with any cool idea, even if it's super elegant and based on brilliant thought experiments. At the end of the day, evidence rules the minds and hearts of scientists. So there are three, what we call classical tests of general relativity that were used in the first half of the 20th century to say like, yeah, general relativity is you know, pretty much right. Of course, nowadays we have so many different tests. It's, it's an incredibly well-tested theory in so many different advanced ways and used in so many different applications. That's going to be a different set of videos further down the line. I want to focus on these classical tests because pretty much they're the easiest ones to, to wrap our minds around. The first one is the orbit of Mercury. So Mercury, closest planet to the sun, and it had been known since Newton's time, shortly after Newton developed universal gravitation, his theory of gravity, that something was funny about Mercury's orbit. So it's slightly elliptical, so it's not perfectly circular, so it's, it's fattened on one side. And this ellipse, this elliptical orbit, has its own kind of orbit around the sun. It does what we call precession. It goes like this. So the point where Mercury is closest or farthest from the sun in its orbit slowly shifts over the course of decades. It's super slow, super tiny. And this effect was pretty well known almost right away. And once you add in the gravitational effects of the other planets, like, oh, there's some tugs from Jupiter over here and even Saturn, way other, you know, Venus nearby. Once you add in those things, you can explain like 90, 95% of this precession of Mercury's orbit. There is still a little bit left over. For the most part, people thought by the early 20th century, people thought it's like no big deal. Like, yeah. Mercury's orbit is a little bit off. It's probably just some little nuance we don't fully understand, some extra gravitational interaction, maybe something funky going on with the sun. Like, like Newton's theory is fine. It's just a tiny, tiny little bit off with Mercury, but like, don't worry about it, folks. Einstein worried about it. Einstein worried about it. Einstein thought that was a clue, that nature was trying to tell us something. That wasn't just we had an incomplete picture of the solar system. Einstein thought that was a potential doorway to new physics. And when he finally arrived at the final form of general relativity, the form we use today, the correct form, if you will, he was able to predict this slight precession of Mercury's orbit, like nailed it. And he this made him absolutely happy. Even though no one else thought this was a problem, he was able to come out and say, hey, you know all this thing that you guys have just been sweeping under the rug for like a couple hundred years? I can explain it. I can explain it with my newfangled theory. I can explain it because Newton's mechanics, Newton's universal gravitation breaks down with objects that close to the sun. It's not accurate anymore. The picture that Newton has of the universe doesn't apply there, but my picture does. Boom. General relativity. That's how he knew he was on the right track. He was able to make another prediction too. Because gravity is curvature, curvature affects everybody, the path of light will get bent. I know light doesn't have mass, but gravity doesn't care. Gravity is curvature. Anything traveling through space-time, whatever you are, whatever you're made of, will uh, be affected by gravity because you will be affected by the curvature. There's no way to ignore it. If you're traveling through space-time and space-time is curved, you are going to curve. You have absolutely no other choice. The path of light will get bent. And he predicted the amount of bending that, say, a, a bit of light 
grazing by very close to the surface of the sun will get deflected just a little bit. So the position of a distant star will get shifted just a little bit. If it's lined up just right, he was able to predict the amount of bending. Sir Arthur Eddington, the number one astronomer in the world at the time, mounted an expedition. You can't do this just like any old day because the sun is uh, like kind of bright and washes out any nearby stars. You can't get a good enough measurement. You have to do it during a total solar eclipse where the light of the sun is blocked out. You can find a star that's coming right up against that surface of that sun. You normally wouldn't be able to see and see if there's any deflection. There was a total solar eclipse in 1918. It went out. Saw it, bingo, nailed it, good job, Einstein. There's a third test. There's a third test of general relativity. This one took a couple decades to finally nail down and measure, but it was measured and it once again vindicated Einstein's work. This one has to do with acceleration and light. Remember, gravity is, gravity causes acceleration and acceleration causes gravity, they're identical. Which means if you can imagine a thought experiment involving, I don't know, fast moving rocket ships or whatever, you can apply that to gravitational systems like the Earth. And one of those examples, imagine you're on a rocket ship, you're just cruising along the universe and you're accelerating because you want to get there in a hurry and a beam of light comes toward you. A beam of light comes toward you. Now you are never, ever, ever going to measure any speed of that light beam other than the speed of light. It, you're never gonna measure a different speed because that's how light works, based, baked into special relativity. But since it is coming towards you, it is going to get blue shifted. It's gonna appear at higher energies because it's coming towards this accelerating object, being you. And so any little beam of light will get tend to shift it towards the blue. Now imagine, now flip that around, imagine sending out a beam of light. Sending out a beam of light has to be exactly mirrored, it has to be the opposite process. So if a beam of light coming towards you is going to be blue shifted, a beam of light going away from you, an accelerating rocket shift is always going to be red shifted. Red shifted can be lower energy. Now, because gravity causes acceleration and acceleration causes gravity, this applies inside rocket ships, this applies on the surface of the Earth, which means if you hold a laser pointer on the ground and shoot it up, as it goes up, it will lose energy. It'll still go at the same speed, don't worry about that. It's still the speed of light, but it will lose energy. It will redshift as it goes up. Now, the Earth is big, but not that big. That's not a ridiculously strong effect, but it is a measurable effect. And in the 50s, there was a Harvard professor and a grad student that were working on this and were able to design an experiment that they shone a beam of light on the ground floor, and then they measured it about four stories up, Einstein predicted a very specific shift in the frequency of that light, a very tiny red shifting, but it was enough to measure. They measured it. It was there. The gravitational red shifting of light is a feature of our universe that Newton would have never predicted that you don't get out of Newton's gravity, that you don't get out of special relativity, but you do get out of general relativity. These three tests put general relativity on an incredibly firm footing that we knew general relativity was a valid theory of gravity for our universe. In the decades since, we've refined our tests more. We've been able to separate out more cleanly general relativity from other competitors and weed out those competitors where now general relativity is applied not just in our solar system, but literally across the universe and through the history of the universe, and it comes out winning every single time. Now, we know general relativity is complete because it is not a quantum theory, and just like all theories have to agree with special relativity, all theories must agree with quantum mechanics at some level because that appears to be fundamental in our universe. We don't have a quantum theory of gravity, but general relativity has passed every single test. So what does that mean going forward? I mean, Einstein was almost too smart. He was, so much, he was so smart, he gave us the theory that is so good, we don't know how to move past that. 
So thanks, Einstein. We really appreciate it. And thank you for watching. If you enjoyed this, please click the like button and subscribe and make sure notifications are turned on so you know when I go live and I do a bunch of, a live show at least once a week. So go ahead and do all the things you need to do so you can get notified. Also, please go to patreon.com slash to help me keep making these videos. I greatly appreciate it and I'll see you next time. And next time... Maybe I'll keep talking about gravity. I don't know. We'll see where it takes us.